All right, so tonight I'd like to introduce Dr. Charles Curtin. Um, he's going to speak tonight on the social and ecological implications of changing fire regimes. Dr. Curtin is the author of more than 70 peer-reviewed papers and several books, including The Science of Open Spaces. This is my copy, <laughs> okay? Um, Dr. Curtin holds a master's degree in land management and a doctorate in zoology, both from the University of Wisconsin. He has over two decades of experience designing or managing some of the largest place-based conservation projects in North America. Dr. Curtin currently directs, some of these are long titles, yeah. <laughs> Regenerative Conservation Design and its program, the Sangre de Cristo Initiative. He lives in Mara Valley and was living there when the Calf Canyon and Hermit's Peak fire moved through. He did not lose any of his buildings, but it did move through his property. And it, it moved, as we all know, through Mora and devastated quite a, quite a few, quite a lot of land. His current work focuses on the consequences of warming and drying climate, particularly how to mitigate the impacts of changing fire regimes. Please welcome Dr. Charles Curtin. <laughs> Thank you. And I should say, I want to keep this pretty informal, so if you have any questions or comments along the way, I've tried to keep it light on text, mostly visual. So jump in any time with questions, I said, or any thoughts you have. Uh, I've organized this talk into three sort of subheadings, subtopics. One, first, I want to talk about uh, forests and our changing forests. These are areas you may well be familiar with, so I apologize to those of you who've seen this work, but it's important context. Then I want to talk about my first-hand experience, as was talked about, we got burned over in the, the Hermes Peak Calf Can fire, and I've been done prescribed fire for decades and lit quite a few myself, but I've been burned boss, but I've never been experienced a fire of that scale. And it's just a whole different animal. So it's useful to see living with fire like that. It's really interesting, because it's, it's reality in the West. It's going to increasingly be the world we live in. Then finally, we'll be talking about solutions, lessons learned, and options going forward, because it's not all doom and gloom by any means. You know, climate's changed, the world's dynamic, it always has been. It may be changing faster than it used to, uh, but yet there's a lot of opportunity there too, so it's not, necessary, it's not all negative by any means. So, uh, well, you know, this is kind of the forest we're used to seeing in New Mexico and across much of the West. I remember uh, one of our uh, sort of county commissioners talking at the eve of the fire, and she said, oh, our beautiful forest, you know, well, the, 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 nothing will ever happen here. Uh, it, it, the fire will never get here, it will never happen. It, our forest will never change. And people are, are so living longingly for the forest existed. But of course, these forests always change. And an ecologist, when I see this, or I see this, that to me is, is not a healthy forest. You know, we're talking about stand densities here about 100 times historic levels. It used to be high, come on in. I mean, the rule of thumb, for example, Ponderosa, is that if you have a 100-foot high tree, before settlement, there was about 100 feet in the next tree. I mean, so really what we had in these landscapes was not forests, but it was savanna with trees, from, except at, at much higher elevations, as in the left slide. And it was really clear when we were, um, after the fires, it was remarkable that a lot of the dense trees were cleared out, and you could see the skeletons of these ancient cedars. And they're like this big around. They're probably 200 year old, 200 year old cedars. And all around were these prairie grasses popping up. So again, we're revealing what's hidden by this anomalous period. So I guess another way to frame this is what we're seeing now is bizarre, is, is anomalous, it, is not, is, is very much a human structured landscape because indigenous burning. Indigenous practices would have kept that landscape much more open and very different than we see today. So you can see this is a photo from about the 1890s and more. And if you look at those back hill slopes, how clear, how empty it is, how, how clear it is. And that was really more typical of this landscape at the time of settlement. So you know, as these wonderful photochronologies are done, 
This is a kind of a typical Ponderosa stand in the 1890s. And by, I forget, there's one stand in Hamas. I don't know if you ever know the name, but I saw it years ago. There's a reference stand north end of Hamas. I don't think it burned recently, but it's, it's a great example and one of the few examples southwest of these kind of old growth stands. So, again, this is about 1890, the same stand, 1909. 1948, again, this fire suppression. 1958, uh, a little bit of thinning, but again, the impacts fire suppression. 1979, mm -hmm. and of course, it's just gone on from there. And you know, this is what we see. So I guess what I'm saying is that uh, very few of us have ever seen a healthy forest. And I find one of the hardest things for me to communicate to people is that what you see is not healthy. It's like if the only example of human you ever saw was people who were you know, ailing, we're, we're not healthy, you'd think that was the norm for people, and yet it's not. Uh, this is actually restored forest outside of Rio Doso, and you can see they've really done a nice job of capturing what goes on. They've got a mixture of stands of size of trees, a rich understory, and that's, by the way, another piece of picture, because if you look through a lot of our forests now, what do you see in the understory? I mean, I mean nothing. It's like, a, it's like a parking lot. It's very poor biodiversity, in terms of biodiversity. You know, this is the typical. You see a you know, big blue stem, you see a lot of prairie grasses. And so there's a very rich understory in these forests. And then you have a, you know, then you bring in a lot of large mammals, a lot of species. So again, we're looking at a very depauperate world. And I say that because there's a lot of threats involved with uh, the density of our forests and the changing climate, but a lot of opportunities, because we've got the opportunity now to really in terms of both fire impacts, also in terms of resources come to their area to, to get back to the kind of forest we've had for much of the last period since the, the last ice age. So again, what we're seeing is what's anomalous. The other thing, of course, all around us is the impact of fire. I look at an image like this, see those aspens. Those aspens are artifact of fire, and you probably may know that. These meadows were probably burned by indigenous people. You're looking at the interface of humans and nature and climate when you look at a landscape like this. Almost any place you see like a big batch of, of uh, aspen like back there, that's a fire scar more than likely. Uh, that meadow, again, probably fire scar. So again, a very human modified system we're seeing today and you can see the relic of past fire. Remember last, it's really neat if you get a chance in the spring you drive around the mountains and when the aspen are just leafing out and they're bright green, you can see those are all fire scars. The landscape's riddled with them and the different ages of aspen stands tell you that fire history or show you a little bit about that dynamic that's played out historically and it's beginning to play out again. So welcome to the Pyrocene. Again, we've really crossed the threshold and people know the Pyrocene is the age of fire. And across much of the West in New Mexico, since about 2010, our climate's passed a threshold where we're no longer fire contributed or fire dominated. The, the climate is, is, just, is, is just right for fire. And you saw that like, those, like last spring, or uh, spring of 22, when the big fires happened uh, in war and other places. You know, it was, it was incredible. We had, uh, you know, they talk about a red flag day. Red flag day means it's severe fire threats, it means low temperature, low humidity, high winds. We had 26 red flag days in a row. Normally, if you get five in a season, that's unusual. And so this is kind of the new normal we're facing. So again, picture the Hermit's Peak Afghan fire, which again, was really there are three fires going on simultaneously, right? There's Hermit's Peak fire. Then almost on top of it began the Cathcan fire, which by the way, burned over similar areas. And then to the north was uh, Cook's Peak. In, uh, and keep in mind, these fires are happening. For example, in the Jemez, we've had, since the Cerro Grande fire, three fires in much the same footprint. Again, three, we had another fire last year, last spring. So I guess my point is that, and I want to drive that point home to you when your policymakers and people talk to you, and they talk about the fire like it was a once-in-a-lifetime once event. Well, no, this is the new norm. You can, and I, I'm trying to get the land on there, Los Alamos National Labs do some modeling for me because to find out exactly what the probabilities are. But I'm guessing that, you know, the probabilities of large fires once a decade is overwhelmingly possible. And keep in mind, by the way, there's there some beautiful fire studies, and the best work done in the Southwest was done up in, uh, by the, the, the ski basin. 
and they have back a chronology going back over a thousand years. And they're showing there then Ponderosa. Ponderosa burned typically between nine and 26 years. So that's what these systems do. And so, and, and you add wind and low humidity, and you see it just, the fires just get bigger and more dramatic. So, again, I'll, this section I'm going to talk about was like to be kind of in the middle of a large fire. And these are images from the farm we live on, which is in Cleveland, just north of uh, Moore. It's the base of uh, Holman Hill. People know that since 518. And um, so you see the fires coming in. They took about 10 days to get from Hermit's Peak up to the Moore Valley. Uh, these photos don't do justice of the height of the flames. I already thought the town had burned. I was amazed there's anything left. When you see flames surrounding the whole area, this went on for days. Um, then, I think it was May 8th, uh, finally the fires were here. And so I've had the time, have, since I haven't been a wildland firefighter, I stayed at the farm and, and helped neighbors and whatnot. And um, the fire, I woke up and looked across the valley, and there were these fires creeping down the hill right across from the farm, just all the way across. And so you can see that white truck there, they're back burning back up the hill to prevent the fire. And I thought, oh, great, this is perfect. The fires came at night. Early morning, they backburn. End of story. Maybe uh, the fires will come back in a week or two. Maybe they'll eat you around. But I thought, you know, it's going to be a long time. By the way, what we did is parked all our vehicles in the fields. That's why these are out here. So you'd bring everybody, put their vehicles out in the field where they had less chance of burning. And ironically, these are middle of prairie dog towns. And one of the few times I think people more were happy to see prairie dogs because it kept the grass low and, and uh, protected their vehicles. Uh, so Two hours later, boom, just the thing quartered around. And it, again, the winds are going 70, 80 miles an hour at that point, And it just ripped right over the top of the farm. These are, it's hard to see. These are 80, 100-foot flames. I mean, and it's just it's phenomenal, the power of these things. They've talked about in, um, I've never seen the figures for this ecotype, but in Canada, some of those boreal river forest fires have the power of 100 atomic bombs. That's how much energy is being released. Just like that. So this, again, you have a century of neglect and not just neglect, I should say. I mean, keep in mind that the patterns we see here are occurring cir circumpolar, you know, in the southwest U.S., in Portugal, in Greece, in Australia. And it's the same pattern often of depopulation of rural areas, lack of resources to maintain the indigenous and then the rural fire regimes and, and management that then leads to these kinds of events. So anyway, the fire was just you know, phenomenal how quickly it passed through. The next morning, you see in this case, the fire backed down. So there's a, a fire break that in this case did work for a neighbor's property. But instead, a lot of homes, I think 78 homes were lost. Uh, all of our neighbors lost homes or outbuildings. Uh, so we were very lucky because we were right down against, we're ringed by alfalfa fields, and we have a sake is, and so a lot, we're well watered. But anyone who's above us or around us pretty much burned, uh, with few exceptions. And you see the heat. I mean, this, this ladder here has been melted into an S shape. The next morning, it looks kind of like a moonscape. That ash is about eight inches to a foot deep. It's like that. It's like, I felt like Neil Armstrong or something, you know, walking through the the ash. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, but it was amazing, frankly, how quickly I thought initially all, all these soils were mineralized, but very little come back. And even by the middle of summer, we'll see some other pictures, they, things came back remarkably quickly. But you can see the, the density of trees there and the amount of, of damage. And I should say, I've probably put in, working with landowners in the area, over 1,000 photo plots this summer and uh, over 20,000 acres. And, about 80 to 90 percent of what burned, burned hot, burned severely like this. But keep in mind, you've got, you say so you have a 340,000 acre fire, uh, but only 60 percent burned inside that perimeter. So there's a lot of stuff that didn't burn. So you don't want to get the idea that this is all like this. So can you repeat that please? So only 60? So if you have, if, so, so if they talk about a 340,000 acre burn perimeter, that doesn't mean that 340,000 acres burned. That's just the perimeter, the outside of it. So 
Of that, maybe 250,000 burned. I, I forget, I've seen numbers on but but yeah, just to be clear, there, there's, it's not, even in an extreme fire situation like this, it's still a matrix. But by the way, that's the difference. These modern fires are just a different whole different critter because usually in a matrix like that, you wouldn't see 80% severe. You know, here it's 80% severe, 20% light ground fire. Usually it'd be about the opposite is what you typically see pre about 2010. The other thing, you know, why I talked about the ecological social is got to be in mind that the impact social, socially these communities, you know, have lived in these landscapes for hundreds of years. So there's a very, very tight correlation. And I like to make the point that the last time this many feds descended on Mora was 1847 when the 7th Cavalry shelled the place. And, and, and so that's the relationship. I mean, the last time the feds shelled, they shelled them. Uh, by the way, led by Kit Carson. I, we're probably in the wrong building, but, <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, it, it's, it's, history's complex. Uh, so, but I just want to play the point, these people are, uh, you know, there's really the trauma of a life way that's very, very closely tied to land. And what I want to keep coming back to is it's not just the fire. What's at stake here is 200 years of, of history of life ways. And it's that intersection of the native plants and the ecology and these people that very much impacts this landscape. And so we've got kind of almost every community that's faced fire has declined. And so there's real opportunity here either to bring jobs in and, and to you know, help these communities or to see them disappear. A lot of our, our heritage here in New Mexico of, of Hispano indigenous people decline. Because these people are largely, you know, more settled by folks in Picaris Pueblo. So these people are of deep indigenous roots as well as being Hispano. A lot of displaced people a uh, lot were just put out in tents out in the plains. And you see the, the, the tents are blowing away, the dust, and it was horrible. Uh, there was, this, and some, a lot of people are still displaced. So that's a big part of the story of uh, a lot of people still don't, are, are living out of trailers. And, and that's a continued impact. I just, again, like to make the point that we don't want to forget the human dimensions to this, which are considerable. But after the fires, of course, nature, you know, it's resilient. It comes out pretty quickly. And you can see, even with severe fires, it's a matrix back there. There's severely burned areas and areas that didn't burn so much. This is actually prairie coming back. Uh, a month later, it was uh, Cytos grandma and blue grandma. Those, you know, about high, you know, nearly thigh high. But then surprise came uh, June 28th. Uh, my partner Ilk and I were going to watch some music in Taos, and we stopped at the barn to um, feed the animals. I walked out five minutes later, and this is what I saw. Five minutes, just like that. The whole valley is filled with water. This went on for nearly two months. Almost every afternoon, there would be the, the, the avenue flood. Now, I should say, this year, the time of the rainfall is different. We didn't get the rainfall. Work, it's expected, the hydrolysis I speak to say it's going to get worse before it gets better. The next six to eight years, we can expect this sort of experience. Um, some other images of the, uh, here are the acequia. It's like a geyser erupting out of the acequia. The, 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 basically, the head gates blocked up valley, and then it just ran right down the acequia, just erupted out of it. And again, here are more pictures of this, the, the river we had through the valley uh, every afternoon. And then, of course, you get all this debris, you get gifts from the neighbors. We get we got refrigerators and tires and all sorts of great stuff that came down. Uh, a lot of it fairly toxic. The other thing that happened is, is how much you raise the, the federal government, and I, I'm not going to bash the federal government, but how unequipped people are to deal with these sorts of disasters. Uh, the um, National Guard came to help with sandbags, but Otherwise, there was just no one. It was sort of had a joke. I mean, that the, that the feds were there in force during the fire, and then the flood showed up, and it was gone. So neighbors would show up, and neighbors helping neighbors, bringing heavy equipment, and we'd trying to put up levees. But again, no federal help. It was all people. The community was just kind of on their own. Uh, and by the way, these bizarre sorts of dynamics were occurring because they tried to block the community to keep people from coming in to stop looting. But, but there are a lot of people like myself there trying to help out the community. And you've got these wild dynamics where, for example, people were 
um, county uh, maintenance crew people were, were sneaking in food in the back of county trucks past uh, state police roadblocks. And I encourage you, if you I, I had a couple of articles on this, uh, both in last summer's and last fall's issues of Green Fire Times. If you, if you are interested in seeing more details, I encourage you to, to look that up, because it, it chronicles this in some detail. But just these crazy things you get uh, county um, officials, or I say our, our county commissioners, trying to stop trucks that were carrying, that were federal trucks, or sorry, county trucks carrying supplies for local people, because the idea was to kind of starve out the local people to prevent them from being there because they wanted to prevent looting. Well, I mean, it just got crazier and crazier. You just can't make this stuff up. I mean, I think my, one of my articles I, I, I entitled uh, Fear and Loathing Near Las Vegas, which is a, 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 you know, a, a takeoff on Hunter S. Thompson, because this is like a Hunter S. Thompson-like. It just got nuttier and nuttier. So again, this is, again the, the human dimensions really matter. Uh, this is a fairly typical situation for me. Floods would show up in the afternoon, got the tractor in the morning, clear it. Floods show up next afternoon, got the tractor, back and forth. Uh, yeah. The acequias, we cleared out the acequia, and here's our mayor Domo uh, there uh, helping guide the water back through the acequia. And by the way, these acequias are really important cultural things. Our ditch, Cancito, is one of the oldest in New Mexico. It's over 200 years old. Again, a very important cultural uh, structure. So we did all this work to clear out the ditch. Two weeks later, plugged. And it continues to plug. Uh, at the moment, they've cleared it and have put in new culverts. But again, the culverts aren't, the hydrologists tell them the culverts aren't big enough. Because part of the problem is the system, FEMA can only replace with what was there. By law, you can only replace what was there. Well, except the ecology of the situation is that we can't, anything that was already there, we already know won't work. But that's the only thing the law will allow. So again, a lot of human dimensions to this. All right, let's talk about lessons and implications. One is the flooding, or rather the erosion. You get this pedestaling. One of the amazing things is to see how much soil was lost, how quickly. Um, if you look, which I had a pointer, that top rock, and this one for you. See how it's black on the top and white on the sides? Anywhere that was dark was above ground when the fires happened. Anything that was light has been exposed. So if you figure it takes about a thousand years to create an inch of topsoil and forest, that's probably looking at what, 8,000 years of loss of soil just in like a couple weeks? I mean, it's so huge the amount of impacts that can occur. Other interesting things, we're talking about na native plants. I mean, there are weeds coming back, but to me, a bigger challenge is what to do with oaks that are coming in in mass. Because you know, when you have small fires, small patchy fires, oaks great. You know, it's a native species. It, it uh, it's uh, wildlife like it. But when you get whole landscapes covered in, in a monoculture, one species that in turn displaces a lot of the other natives, it becomes an issue. And I, I struggle with that a lot when I advise landowners. I mean, God forbid you. Use chemicals on it? Well, that's, that's not a great solution. But this isn't a great solution either. So this, this is what a lot of the landscape looks like. And that's something we're going to have to continue to grapple with. Because NRCS and other kind of ways of dealing with fire, with small fires, you know, if you have a 40 acre fire or something, you get a little patch of oaks, you know, who cares? But we have fires in the Moore Valley that occurred in the 40s, where the oaks are there. I mean, it's going to be centuries before you're able to move that system on to other kinds of composition. And so again, it's, it's, it's a management of that values, right? But what are the values? You know, well, there, there are some, you know, some tough choices here. Uh, there's a lot of uh, thinning. Uh, NRCS paid for uh, this helicopters that would drop um, both mulch and seed. Uh, actually, the federal guidelines are pretty good. The problem, though, was that they didn't follow them. Here's an example of, on, on the left is, well, I'm sorry, on the right, that's about the, what the federal guidelines require for mulch, about one to three inches, about that much. Yeah, just like in your garden. This is what you typically see. So out of, I said, nearly 2,000 photo plots this summer, over 20,000 acres, I've probably a number of plots that had adequate amount of mulch, I count in both hands. 
So you know, what's what's that? What percentage? You know, ten out of eighteen hundred, whatever two thousand or it is. And after midsummer, they stop mulching. And this is again the most. All the federal guidelines show that the most important fat, most important thing you do for fire recovery is mulching. Now, I don't want this is not meant to denigrate the agencies. By the way, these periods overwhelm. Our, our systems are not designed for fire to scale. So it's not that people are like saying, oh, well, let's just not do it. Uh, it's simply the system is not designed to deal with this. They're, this is not the resources. I mean, if you had, and by the way, we got very lucky in more in that the fires happened early in the season. If they'd happened later in the season when there were fires going on in California and Colorado and Montana, et cetera, you know, we would have had a fraction of the resource we got. As it was, we got almost everything. And yet still, it's just not enough. So again, our system just simply is not set up. But by the way, it's not necessarily a bad thing because there's real opportunity. We'll talk about it later. Um, you know, these communities in northern New Mexico and other rural areas are really lacking jobs and um, you know, ways to earn a living uh, on the ground. And, 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 and the forestry and the forests are part of their lifeblood and livelihood. So there are ways to create a forest economy that's not just about cutting down trees, it's about reviving the forest. So there are huge opportunities here if we make the societal commitment to do this. Again, you know, more, more value judgments. The other one is grasses. Um, turns out when they seeded, 95% of what they see is barley. Uh, and what you get is uh, these monocultures of barley. Uh, and again, this was kind of a way to kind of get stuff on the ground to react to political pressure. Just want to get cover on the ground. The problem, though, was that uh, barley by itself doesn't prevent, I mean, grasses, seeding doesn't prevent erosion. But the bigger issue is that this, this grass is now nearly head high. And in Fire parlance, that's a type three fuel. That's the most flammable fuel out there. That's the stuff that burned Maui this summer. So we've planted at a cost of millions of dollars. We've created a fire threat without addressing erosion. And again, it's not, there's no blame you point individual. It's not an individual's fault. It's the way the system is not set up. The system is not yet caught up to the reality we have in terms of the climates and the kind of dynamics we have. Um, I talked about erosion of roads. Also, it's this crazy thing I mentioned where FEMA can only replace like by like. I watched these same two culverts replaced four times last summer. There's probably hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars spent to replace the same culvert that keeps blocking because the laws are only set up to replace like with like. Again, it's just not there are these kinds of deficiencies that we're just not set up to address dynamics of scale. There are some other issues going on there. Well, I, this is probably the part I find scariest. Um, this was taken the morning after the fires blew over top of us. I'm standing a ridge above a farm, and you look, what, a mile and a half, two miles off, and you see those plumes of smoke? That was spotting off this ridge to there. That's how far out things are spotting. So when you talk about, like around um, some of these big fire breaks you see around Taos or you see around Angel Fire, there some of these are four days or dozer width wide. I mean, so there are each. These are big dozers, so it's probably twice the width, three times the width of this room. It's just useless under this kind of regime. The other thing we're seeing, I should include a, a slide, is. Um, Forest thinning is another dynamic that's changed a lot. Um, I had an amazing tour not long after the Cerro Grande fire, the fire that burned uh, Los Alamos. And um, it's incredible. The fire would roar through the crowns. It hit a thinned area, drop down, go along the ground. As soon as it got to the end of the, of the uh, burned area, it ladder back up, take off again. I've, as I said, out of, out of you know, nearly 2,000 plots, I've seen dozens and dozens of thinned areas in the last few months. Not one of them stopped the fire. Now, the trees were better off. The soils were better off. They definitely are in much more restorable condition than the areas were not thinned. But all the trees still died. So again, we're in just a very different kind of management regime. I'll come to this at the end of how that we need to think differently. Uh, and by the way, Taos County is phenomenal forest restoration and fire mitigation program. But again, it's based on old ideas that 
fire breaks work and that thinning stops things. And it doesn't so much anymore because we're in a very different climatic regime. Now, one hopes that the next time you have big fire is not going to be the sheer, you know, as radical a weather as there was under this fire, but the reality is that it's, it's, this is, this is you know, kind of a new norm. The big worry, again, in terms of communities is this. Um, we don't have the resources to thin. Well, is there, there are two, there's catch-22, right? You can either thin the forest, you're bringing heavy machinery into the forest, and you're, that creates you know, one set of damages and disturbances, and I'm sure you all can imagine that. Or else you let the trees fall. And so at the moment, one of the things that really worries me is that these are communities that are going to relied on the forest for centuries. This is what we're about to look at. Uh, I've lived in Montana in places where the fires, the forest didn't get managed after the fire. Uh, after this year, the Sawyers, you know, guys who had chainsaws, said they're not going to the forest. It's too dangerous. So after this year, walking in the woods is as windy as hazardous because the tops can start coming down. After that, trees start coming down. And again, you can imagine if people have relied on these forests for centuries for livelihoods, for grazing, for hunting, for all these purposes, and that's what you have to look at. It's, it really makes it a tough situation. So again, one of the things that I talk to our legislators, talk to the governor and folks to kind of make the point that, look, this is a, this is a social justice issue. Do we leave this? Or do we try and find solutions that can you know, maintain the health of these communities that are very much a part of our cultural heritage in New Mexico? So again, making a point, this area has been settled for you know, centuries. Uh, it has people with deep roots to the land, deep, deep connections that are uh, bordering on, I don't say bordering, they're, they're spiritual, they're, they're religious. They're, it's amazing when you get talking about and going to religious ceremonies with penitentes and other traditional religious sects, how much the forest and these ideas come in. I mean, there's a, a fascinating blend of indigenous and uh, Catholic religions and reverence for land that, that intersect in these cultures. It, it's, it's um, again, a lot of uh, hearings, response. This is uh, uh, Teresa Ledger Fernandez there, a congressman. Uh, a lot of outreach, but ironically, one of the sad things is that um, the Hermes Peak Cath Canyon Bill 2000 was really a landmark piece of legislation. It was incredibly effective at trying to make people whole. Um, we've actually lost ground so far in terms of the response. There's been a lot of, of uh, resources spent on contractors and whatnot, but not a lot's really gone to the ground yet. And so a lot of my work, frankly, increasingly is finding ways to try and get our legislators to realize, again, it's, social it's, it's an ecological issue, it's a social justice issue, it's about New Mexico's heritage. And what we do here is going to have ramifications across the state because of fires. You know, this is not a one-shot deal. So again, you know, these cultural impacts are huge. The college and culture are totally blended in these systems. But like I said earlier, I do not look at this. this is, I don't mean this to be a negative or sort of a dramatic presentation, I think it's worthwhile talking about the realities, but there's a lot of opportunity because with the amount of resources are coming in and with the climate changing and fire cycle shifting, we have an opportunity to really steward our forests and get them back into a more healthy matrix. And uh, this is actually an, a pencil drawing of the Moore Valley in 1859. And it's pretty open. I mean, there are some trees, some forests some on the hillsides, but it's a much more open matrix. And we were actually having lunch with a gentleman who's a ranch in Moore this today at noon, he's saying, well, maybe I should be planting prairie, not trees. And there's a lot of that, of thinking about, again, that's why I, it's wonderful to talk to groups like yourselves who are so aware of native plants. There's a real opportunity to think very creatively about, you know, not just, just let's put back pines and densities as they were in 1970, because that's what we grew up with, uh, but think about this, uh, it's going to be a very different matrix. There are some fascinating studies suggesting that every forest in the western U.S. will be transformed by fire in the next 50 years. And uh, the computer simulation, so you know, we take it for what it is. But again, there are real opportunities to re-envision our future. And you can imagine if you get back native grasses, you could have pastorals, you have grazing, um, things like um, already the streams, many of the streams in the Moore Valley have been almost down to trickles. And the streams are coming back. I mean, just, just the hydrology, that means you could have much more organic farming, much more local jobs. So that there's a silver lining here if we choose to embrace it. 
if we say, oh, we want to create the past circa, you know, fall of 2021, you know, that's probably a losing proposition. We say, well, what, how do we re-envision our landscapes given the reality? What can we do to bring back native plants and bring back cultural elements? There's a lot, there's a lot of possibility. Um, some of the things we're doing is very quickly. I, I end up, I'm an ecologist, but I'm more and more work on the social, ecological, policy, and cultural elements. And this is, you, know, you go into details here, you probably can't read it anyway, but uh, just to point out where, for example, me, ironically, as an ecologist, I spent a lot of my summer working on housing. Why would, what does housing have to do with fire recovery? Well, it turns out that when you talk to all the, the contract people who want to help restore the forest, they say, we're not, we're not limited by money, we're not limited by markets, we're limited by workforce. Workforce is limited by housing. And so ironically, you know, if you want to restore forests, you got to get housing, which is kind of crazy. So here I'm an ecologist and conservationist thinking about becoming a thing of housing subdivisions. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's crazy. But yet, if you can get a small amount of housing that has a small footprint landscape that allows you large landscape restoration, that may be what's needed. So what we're doing right now is starting from, okay, what will it take to restore our forests? Not just the ones that burn, but the ones that are likely to burn. How, how many jobs is that? Or I should say, how much work does that take? How many jobs does that take? How many houses does that take? So really thinking back about the whole system and interactions, because the whole thing's entwined. Finally, it's kind of show staging. So this is, this is again, showing a lot of these are occurring there are some things, so like a lot of social justice pieces are fairly far down the pipeline. We're talking about a lot of ecological things are up farther up in the pipeline. If you look at these Gantt charts, again, you can't really see it. I'd mostly show you this to give you an idea of this is the level of complexity you got to deal with. You can't just simply say, oh, uh, we'll thin some trees. Oh, we'll do this, we'll do that. You got to do it all simultaneously. And this actually comes back to the, the, the book, which I should say why I got into this is uh, this book and my other writings are about. Um, collaborative conservation, community-based work. And I should say that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, governments, it's not that they're not well-meaning, incredibly committed people, part of a lot of these programs. They simply are not set up to do this kind of work, or the kind of work that needs to be done for restoration. Why? Because federal jobs typically rotate about every five years. Uh, a lot of our public servants are responsible to the politicians who return, rotate every five or 10 years. So. I guess the point I make here is that this is about local empowerment. So groups like yourselves have a really important role to play in creating awareness. And you can't wait for agencies or entities to do the job for you. And we found this actually book, what it really chronicles, is work across the globe from the southwest to the coast of Maine to Egypt and parts of the Middle East. Mostly talks about North America. But the point we make here is that the only difference that's ever been done, really, in natural resources has come from local people taking responsibility and being engaged. And that's really what's going to take in a changing world, because the agency is not, they're not meaning well, it's just happening so much faster. The political politicians, even though they uh, may mean well, it's hard to envision how rapidly our climate and our forests and landscapes are changing. So that's, I think, the role of citizens is to hold people's feet in the fire and encourage them to think responsibly. Yes? Do you have a placement Yeah, actually that, believe it or not, is what well, I should say, it's funny. It's about a quarter million dollars. A quarter million, $250,000. Which actually is funny. So people who aren't in this world say, well, that's a lot of money. People are say, well, no one will believe you can do it for that. Um, but we work cheap. <laughs> and, and by the way, we've got things, like we've got a blue ribbon panel of a lot of top ecologists, forest ecologists in the country who are coming together to help us to advise us because we want people who don't have any political, basically whose salary is not tied to what they say about forests in New Mexico. We don't build well, oh, no, no, that's a longer term. That's a, that's a long term thing, yeah. So housing, we want to do, here what we're doing is saying, okay, how many houses, what would you do with in this phase one? And actually a guy named Mark Lautman, who's a probably top, ironically, probably top housing developer in the, in the state, he built Rio Rancho essentially is on, on board and working with us, because we need guys like that who can say, OK, here's how many we need. So you know, you're right. When it gets down to how many houses, that's, that's a 10-year that's, that's operation. Here, we're just trying to, in 18 months, figure out, scope out 
what's, what's the scale of this thing? What, what's needed? But keep in mind, you know, we've got, we're talking about a, a, a $7 billion budget for fire recovery. We could do this. And that's, again, why it's so important for people like yourself to be aware and say, no, we're not going to do, you know, replace culverts with culverts we already know aren't going to work. We want to have long-term solutions. We've got the resource. We were joking today. We were at a hearing with uh, some of the folks from Los Alamos National Labs. And uh, an economist there pointed out that the fire recovery budget in Moore County, which is 1,800 people, not 1,800 people, I'm sorry, 4,200 people, is almost bigger than Los Alamos' budget for the same time period. <laughs> I mean, we've got the resources to do it. It's a matter of stewardship and taking the long view. So I'll stop there, and uh, again, more questions. Yes? What's the ratio between public land and privately held land yeah. that was impacted? Oh, great. Thank you. Great. Excellent question. And that's one of the things that are unique about this fire. Most lands and the fires and burns in the West, kind of referring to, are public lands. This, if you look at the, the, the crest of the mountains, the San Cristos, the fire is about 80% east side, 20% west side. Of the east side, 80% of that's private. So this is overwhelmingly a private fire. Now that actually has some really interesting implications. On the positive side, you can manage much more rapidly. You don't have, you have NEPA and these very constraints that can make it hard to get in there and manage rapidly. The flip side is our way our system works FEMA basically works like a big insurance company. Essentially, if you got X amount burned up, you know, if you got, um, you know, say a million dollars of timber burned up, they give you a check for a million dollars. So far, what we don't know is, is there any accountability to use that money to um, restore the land or will it just go to, um, you know, homes in Florida? Uh, and that's the big, the scary thing right now we're dealing with is that there are going to be a lot of millionaires all of a sudden in Moore County, the contractors, people who have these, there will also be a lot of millionaires, people who've had family, who've had family land for centuries. Um, what are they going to do with it? And it's a tough one. I don't know. You know, if I had property, if I had 1,000 acres burned up and someone offered me $2 million, you know, I mean, it's easy to say, well, of course, I'd, I'd restore it, but, and I probably would, but. That's, uh, but, you know, a lot of people are going to say, well, uh, how do we best serve my family? Maybe I should put in a bank. So you raise a really interesting question that one of the biggest challenges we face is what to do long term. And when I talked about a minute ago about the Hermes Peak Calf Canyon bill versus the, um, the current uh, the Sarah Grande bill, one of the things we'd like to figure out a way to do is can we build a trust not for the haves, not for the people who've got land and got contracting businesses, but for the 80% of the population who lives at the verge of poverty. What are we going to do for those people? Because the worry is that we're going to accelerate rural population, accelerate the difference between the haves and have-nots. Again, a bunch of millionaires who had land or, or businesses, and the rest of people are stuck. It's tough. Are land speculators developing and moving in? There is some of that, yeah. Yeah, there's some of that. And, uh, yeah, you're definitely seeing, and a lot of people are just taking a check. Uh, I have a friend who... Um, that's retired forest service, lovely woman. They built a dream house. They, uh, they retired, built their dream house. Six months later, it was ash. And yeah, they're living in an apartment in Santa Fe. I mean, and they don't really not sure what to do. And that's the reality of a lot of people. But you're right, there are speculators. By the way, the big issue here is, of course, not land, but water, right? More, it's one of the wettest valleys in New Mexico, if you don't know that. It's a it's about twice the rainfall of Taos. Um, a lot of moisture coming off the mountains. And so really, the big market here is in water. And what's going to happen is water rights. And that's going to be a really interesting battle. So again, we need to really think long term, because the in impacts, like I said, that, that, that drama, the fire ripping on the top of you, is, is that, that's the simple stuff. That's just the beginning. Uh, it's all these cascading effects that are really where we're trying to think about how do we deal with this? Because again, we could be a model for how to have really positive responses, or we could be a model for another paradise like California, entity. And I have a friend who, who litigated paradise and tells, tells me firsthand about what happened. The families left, they, you know, there's, it's a shell of what it was. The resources, we aren't set up to deal with this. Our institutions aren't. And that's why, again, to me, it's such a political question. 
a lot of my motivation of speaking to you all today is hopefully feel like you will, when you see your senators or see your congressmen or talk to people, say, hey, you know, this is, there's a much more complex reality out there. But again, it's not all doom and gloom, right? There's an incredibly vibrant, interesting future that's possible and it's doable, but it takes the vision and the commitment to do it. Yes, and I'm seeing yeah, not a lot of that, <laughs> but, um, but again, holding people to fire, feet to the fire, right? I mean, you can do that, but yeah, and, and having the vision. Um, you have to be able to vision to make it happen, right? And I think a lot of folks, they say, well, we want our trees back the way they were, they were two years ago. Well, the trees were already, even without the fire, the trees are on the way out. You know, the climate's changing enough that the trees that were there aren't going to be, our forests are not the same as they were going to be. And that's okay. That's what things change. But you're right. It's the political will, and that's a big part of the challenge. And that's why so much of my time is spent really thinking about the political piece here, forming alliances with a lot of indigenous and Hispano groups, because it says it says it's much social justice as ecology. Other questions, comments? Well, it's interesting. Someone asked me today, we were talking over lunch about the Cerro Grande, and there was a lot of interesting work done in Cerro Grande, and we learned a lot, um, particularly around watershed restoration and how to prevent flooding. What we've learned less, what's probably less applicable is that, um, is how rapidly their forests have changed. Let me give you an idea. When I, so I came to New Mexico in 95 as a postdoc at UNM. And at that point, the whole deal was pinon. Oh, pinon are going to take over our forests and we're going to be, you know, it'll be the end of the world. Uh, ten years later, it's like, our oh, pinons are dying. They're gone. What are we going to do without pinons? I mean, that's how quickly these systems change. And so that it's, uh, and, and so I guess where I'm going with that is that um, a lot of the techniques we've done in the past it's questionable how applicable they are. And one of the things I'm doing with this blue ribbon panel of scientists, I'm, really, I'm charging them with saying, what is realistic? We want alternative future conditions. Well, we don't want them to go to the polymath maker and say, here's some choices. You can have this, you can have this, you can have that. You know, it's the value, that's a value judgment then. You know, do you want savannas and prairies and agriculture communities? Do you want to try and prop up a forestry industry? Do you want to just let it burn? Those are all, you know, those are all choices. But we want to be able to starkly present those options so the policymakers are have feet are held to fire. And they gotta choose. Or and hopefully folks like you will help them choose. Question here too. So we kind of know how to restore pasture lands and mm -hmm. how to restore, you know, mm -hmm. pine trees. But when you start talking about creating a prairie ecology, mm -hmm. how much do we really know how to do it? And the barriers around having the seed bank to mm -hmm. implement this, or do the transplants to mm -hmm. implement that? Mm -hmm. Good um, question. Where are we at on any of that? Yeah. It's interesting. Well, and I say, I, I'm from Wisconsin originally, so I grew up with prairies, and tall grass prairie is kind of my near and dear to my heart. Uh, but um, ironically, a lot of the early classic work in restoration was done taught, was on prairie. All Leopold, if you're a lot of people don't know, all Leopold did a lot of pioneering work in prairie restoration in the 30s. It's interesting, he went from being a forester to being a prairie restorationist later in his career. Uh, and then, of course, he did some funny things. We started planting white pine prairies, but that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> uh, but so your point, we actually had to gloss and know quite a bit. It's amazing how the seed bag is out there. Again, the will, I actually think it would be easier to create a matrix of prairie and savanna then because you need fewer trees. The big limitation is find a place to plant trees. We have, even though we're ramping up hugely our, our stock of pine seedlings, it's still a fraction of what's needed. I think the, that's the other thing, I think it's a win-win. And again, I'm speaking totally shooting from hip on this, but my perception is that it'd be easier to do a prairie savanna mix because a lot of the south slopes, the areas that France were traditionally prairie anyway, you know, let me prairie. And a lot of those grass are coming back. The seed propagation, it's actually pretty, that's, I suspect it's easier to do. Now the steep slopes, you have to come up with other strategies. But again, you know, it would have cost, we were, we're spending, um, for what it would cost to have seeded barley, it wouldn't have been a whole lot more to have se seeded prairie grasses. Now they wouldn't have come in as fast. But, uh, but yeah, so me against, it's, it's will, right? Creativity and having that vision. 
Uh, but yeah, prairie restoration is very sophisticated and it's been that way for a long time. We, and actually, I think uh, now, how close an ecotype do you want? Because I know right now our closest native seed sources in big batches come from Dolores, Colorado. That I don't know if that's close enough, but you know, uh, it, it's it's very doable. Yeah. Back there. Oh, good question. Um, you know, I'm talking a range of things. And, and, you know, by the way, you, know, you should probably know, more is more County is a gem. It goes from, you know, the tops of the mountains, goes from, what, 12,000 feet down to about 6,000 feet on the Canadian River. Uh, it's this amazing eagle And the diversity there is phenomenal. And it's amazing. Everything I thought I knew about prairies. And I'll be walking high up in some mountain, like 10,000 feet, and be coming across big blue stem. It's not supposed to be there, but no one planted it there, right? It was there. Uh, Cytos grandma, a lot of mid, well, so there's an amazing mixture of stuff going on there. So again, when you look at these landscapes, it appears that at least the south slopes, that's what they were. Up to about the subalpine zone were savannas on the south station slopes. North slopes, a little different, but again, the mixture. So yeah, I'm, I see in coming back, um, you see big blue stem and other things popping up in places you never would have dreamed it would be. But it was, again, it was in the seed bank. It's been in the seed bank for 100, over 100 years. It's there. You know, and, and so, so I think it's, an, uh, it's going to be a fascinating mix of things, uh, of, of these different grasses. A lot of it's blue grandma, uh, a lot of the native bunch grasses, but uh, there will be other things there too. Uh, yeah. so, you know, so it's interesting. You know, we're in such a fascinating area ecologically because it's such a melting pot of plains, and you know, here of course we're on Colorado Plateau. You go to the mountains, then you go to the plains. This bizarre mixing that occurs. Yeah. I don't think I answered your question, but but yeah, you see a lot of it out there. Any other questions? Well, one can imagine a situation where if we want to get back to to more local agriculture, you know, and a lot of the, you know, by, I don't know if you know that. Um, you can plot where the bunch grasses were, where you look at where the bison herds were. Uh, you know, the bunch, blue gram in particular is incredible. And by the way, I don't know if you know, blue grandma, you know, I, I keep wanting to have like on our dollar bill, it shouldn't be the eagle, it should be blue grandma. Because <laughs> blue grandma went from Mexico all the way to central Canada. I mean, it's, it's the heart of our continent. It's this little plant, you know, pretty, that's got, of course, roots go way down. Why I say that is that blue grandma, a lot of the grandma grasses cure out really well. So actually they're better forage. A lot of the European grasses are really, you know, that's why I feel like hay out of them. They're lousy forage much of the year. Um, so in other words, why, my quip about the bison, the bison herds followed. They went way out east in the plains and they came back up into these valleys in New Mexico in the fall and winter, in the winter here, because that's where the bunch grasses were. They were, they were better. So I can imagine um, you know, has kinds. I can imagine a situation where you have this really interesting landscape. You've got more water for organic farming down the valleys. You've got people grazing the side slopes. Again, not the kind of intensive grazing that leads to erosion, the kind of grazing that stewardship. And, and you can imagine a pastoral system where you know, they get more money for the cows. They, you know, again, you have a very vibrant economy. You combine that with the forestry industry where the forestry industry you know, is no longer you know, a couple of guys and a pickup truck and a chainsaw, you're talking about, you know, a million dollar piece of equipment that some guy sits in the air conditioning cab with a joystick. And a lot of these are very low impact. They're not the kind of ripping up lad lies things. There's a firm from Oregon that's working on the Philmont Ranch and they do amazing stuff with uh, cables and systems to work on steep slopes. And it's, it's incredible how low impact you can be if you, and of course, Philmont has deep pockets. They can afford to do that. Most people can't. But again, you make that political decision, you can do those kind of things. So. How much of a risk does the fire area have for invasive like mm -hmm. seagrass, mm -hmm. uh, sage, all these other yeah. toxic things, uh, yeah. You're thistle? Yeah. Uh, how much is that a risk? You haven't mentioned that at you all. No, it's good. That's yeah. human intervention. Yeah, yeah no, and I, again, I, I haven't mentioned because it's so uneven. It's fascinating. Back to your question, but essentially, I've got one landowner I work with who is this beautiful place, uh, 
outside Las Vegas. It's rolling. It should be in the best condition of anything, and it's the weediest I've seen. And I think because he's got horses. And so there is, again, and again, it's how you graze and how you do this that makes a big difference. There are ways to graze, so you don't have that impact. But um, I'm amazed how much native species I see out there in the landscape. There are definitely weedy places where it's highly, highly impact disturbed. They're coming in. Um, but keep in mind, a lot of those you know, are annuals. And a lot of those things, again, with work and stewardship, you can get back a lot of natives. But you know, you're right. I didn't touch that because it's just so complex. And NRCS you know, wants to go out there and spray. And I'm not, I don't know. That's a tough one, right? Uh, but yeah, they're definitely weeds. And they're right. That's a big impact of fire. But I'd say as much as I've seen weeds, I've seen a lot of natives come back that, like I said, have been suppressed for 100 years. So I, I think it's, it's really a mixed bag, and a lot of it depends on the land, history of land stewardship and current land stewardship. Yeah. Is there a good question. So they, typically you wait a year or two before you plant trees. New Mexico has been way, I think, I forget what the numbers are, but we're really lacking in capacity to plant trees. By the way, keep in mind, it's not just planting trees of the right ecotypes. Ponderosa goes down into almost the central Mexico. So what ecotype do you want? And there's a lot of research going on at UNM and NMSU um, about what's the appropriate ecotype, because the ones that are there now probably won't do very well in 100 years or 200 years. So. Um, there, there's the state legislature has about $5 million to support a partnership of a uh, certain number of universities to increase the amount of pine seedlings. So that's where we're ramping up. But we got the problem. I mentioned these grasses. These grasses now, you know, they, or oaks, neither, both pretty actively exclude pine seedlings, I should say. So again, what do you do uh, Around that, and I don't know. I mean, I, I think with some landowners, I'm tempted to say just get out, just graze it. Although I'm told by some folks their cows don't do well in that barley. It's actually hard on them. Um, so it, it, it's a tough one. Uh, yeah, and then that's when you kind of get down to the landowner level. We're trying to work with people what their goals are and how they try and manage land. But like I said, so again, reiterate. More in San Miguel County are overwhelmingly private land and overwhelmingly small holders and all overwhelmingly poor smallholders. So it makes it really tough as to how you manage that. It's not like, I mean, one of the advantages of, of, of this side of the mountain is that you know it's largely federal lands, and, and things can be done uh, consistently. Now, that said, the federal agency, at least the Forest Service, the higher elevation said there's just can't do anything for it. They're not going to do anything with it. They just can't afford to do anything with it. So a landowner may be able to afford to do it. But like I said, it's a big open question. If, you know, if you're struggling to put your kids through school, and you get you're given a million dollar check. What do you do with it? And you know that's a tough one. Other questions or comments? I want to make one final point. You know, I keep saying so. I want to reiterate that I do not see his talk as doom and gloom. You shouldn't either. This is a period of immense opportunity. We can do a lot. I mean, these problems are a hundred years in the making or more. They're not going to be solved in overnight. But yet, there's huge opportunity. The amount of resources are flowing in this area. And I think we, our job, like I said, as tricky as you all, as, as people who are concerned about the natural environment, is to, is to encourage our policymakers to think carefully about what we do and not just put more trees back or not just put in grasses because that's what the public writ large wants. You guys have an opportunity to weigh in and say, look, we've got an amazing opportunity to return our landscape to kind of health and robustness it hasn't had for a century. But that means very, being very smart about how we do that work. And Unfortunately, the political politics tend to work on shorter time frames. Did I? Is there anything wrong with the effect of the legislation to encourage federal land? Well, it's really interesting. I mean, there was some really creative work done with the Hermes Peak Lat Cafcan bill. And I actually need, I'm one of my projects in the near, near term is to look back at the literature. And we're actually, I have some legal teams I want to work with about trying to enforce some of that. Actually, I should say there are three things going on, not just one. We're, again, it's a really exciting time. First thing, the Forest Service revised their national standards on fire recovery. Very progressive document. I don't think the leadership understands the implications of it, but it's very, very, it's phenomenal. Second, uh, Biden's 
fire de disaster declaration. Again, very, very progressive, uh, very far-reaching. Again, it's not been enacted. I don't think people understand the ramifications. Third one is the Hermes Peak Cath Canyon Bill, which sought to uh, follow, again, the Cerro Grande fire, but actually add more benefits for private landowners. Because keep in mind, Cerro Grande was largely you know, suburban communities around Los Alamos. This is these rural communities where it gets a hit. And by the way, fourth one is the infrastructure bill. Again, there's opportunities to really put a ton of money into, you know, what future do we want? Do we want a future of, of um, you know, tree farms? Or do we want a future of this kind of rich agricultural mosaic I, I talked about? That's open the bill. So in other words, there's, at the moment, the infrastructure there, the bills, are phenomenally far-reaching. So far, the way they've been enacted has been a huge disappointment because I think the people don't have, you know, they can't, they're not ecologists. They don't see the big vision of what's possible. And so a lot of what I'm trying to do is figure, well, how do we hold Pills feet to the fire and say, well, you know, you know uh, here's what the bills say and here's what is actually happening. And I mean, the final point, the <laughs> Sarah Grande, that, that bill was fought over a decade. It, took, it didn't happen overnight. And we've got a long time, I think, to look at what we see and see results and say, no, this isn't right. This, this isn't the outcome we want. We want this. And to reach out to people, you know, some of our, our legislators, who I think a lot of who do get it, but they just need the pressure. I'm sorry, go on now. I'm just trying to understand if there are some specific, like, if there are more efforts in mm -hmm. the Well, I think there was initially, um, I, guess I encourage you to read the Hermes P. Cath Canyon language. It's really quite progressive. But like I said, it doesn't match the reality and ground. So I think often a lot of folks don't have the ecological sophistication to realize what it's talking about. And so I think there's need for that. Unfortunately, what I've seen more of is that groups um, are just taking the money. You know, if you're offered, you know, if, you're, if you're running an agency and you're offered $5 million to do what was done in the past. Again, I think people a lot just taking the resources. And so I'm not seeing a lot of creative decision making. I've been told we're the only group doing this. And here I am, you know, some PhD and more and a handful of friends and colleagues who are trying to pull this off. Uh, partly because we don't, you know, I don't have to worry about someone wanting to give me $5 million for my program. So I, it's like I've got some flexibility to be thinking more critically about it. But, but again, it comes back to, too, local empowerment. These programs I could talk about in the book here. Most environment work is local. You know, the, the old phrase, all politics is local. All conservation is local, too, right? I mean, granted, there's global work that goes on, the Paris Accord and on and on. But I'd argue that overwhelmingly it gets done, gets done at the grassroots level with people who are engaged directly on the ground to decide to care and do something about it. And there's a lot of leverage there. Uh, but the moment is kind of disarray. I think people are kind of waiting to see what's going to happen. I think people are being tempted by the money, and it's... Yeah, it's, it's just really interesting time. But like I said, I don't look at it with despair. I think there's a lot of opportunity, but it, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a fight. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you all. appreciate your attention.